Hello everyone, Russ of Aquarimax here. Today I'll be answering a question about isopods from Wally Kern. Actually, a series of questions. He wanted to know more about what separated the care of different species, about hydration, about basically day-to-day -day maintenance. So we'll be talking about that. He originally got my question when he watched um, my video on how to care for isopods. That video, which you can watch in this card here, is more focused on the general setup of the enclosure, but he was wanting me to delve a little bit more into specifics, so that's what we're going to do today. Well, first of all, he asked about the day-to-day -day maintenance of isopods. I would like to say that isopods really don't require daily maintenance. Um, that's one of the beauties of isopods. Uh, you can care for them twice a week, three times a week, sometimes even less. If you go on vacation for a week and you set up everything well in their enclosure, they'll be fine for that whole week. But I usually like to look in on my isopod several times a week, two to three times a week at minimum. And uh, when I do, there are several things that I like to pay attention to. Uh, one of them is hydration. Uh, it's really important to make sure that your isopods never dry out. But this doesn't really vary from species to species. Now, moisture preferences from species to species can vary, but something you can do to kind of take care of that and not have to worry about it is to create a moisture gradient and you just do that by moistening one side of the enclosure and leaving the other side dry putting in some cover and the isopods can regulate their own moisture needs so what i usually do is try to moisten the enclosure uh, about twice a week but it depends if it doesn't need it if i can reach in and feel that the soil feels moist i can feel the dampness in the soil then it probably doesn't need to be uh, moistened at all but if it does, I'll put two or three uh, tablespoons of water for a six quart container like this one. And I will use water that has been carbon filtered. Uh, my refrigerator produces water, it goes through a carbon filter. So I just have a half gallon container that I use and um, squirt two or three tablespoons in one side of the enclosure. And that usually takes care of things. Uh, the, it's really the ventilation that varies from species to species. And uh, for my Armadillidium isopods, such as my zebras or my peaches or my Montenegro isopods, I use a lot of ventilation. As you can see in these enclosures, I cut fairly sizable holes in the lids and screen them over. I also put holes in the sides of many of those containers to make sure there's quite a bit of ventilation. Uh, it's a similar thing with my Spanish Porcelio isopods, my Titans. I have a large cutout in the lid that is screened off. Uh, to make sure that they're getting plenty of ventilation. For most of my other isopods, I still have a little ventilation drilled into the side and covered with some kind of screening. The isopods that get the least ventilation are my Oniscus ocellus, as they require a pretty moist environment, and my uh, Trichoranitomentosa, or my dwarf whites. I don't actually add any ventilation at all to their enclosure. Uh, there is ventilation just by nature of the fact that these lids are not completely tight-fitting. But other than that, I don't add any ventilation and they don't seem to require it and it helps maintain the high humidity that they're used to from their tropical environment. So now let's talk a little bit about food. Now food doesn't really vary as a practical matter from species to species. There are some that eat more protein and you know they're a little bit more opportunistic as far as protein goes. But in general I find it's not really an issue as long as I'm giving a variety uh, in the diet and that some of those items do uh, include protein because the main bulk of isopods diet, of course, comes from their substrate. They're eating the, the decaying leaves and wood and compost and so on in the substrate. But I do add supplementary food two to three times a week, and it's, it varies from week to week. If it's, It might just be once, it might be three or four times. It depends. Basically, I give them proteinaceous foods like bug burger, like uh, goldfish food pellets, once in a while, once in a great while, I give them the shells of shrimp. I don't eat shrimp very often, but when we do, I save the shells and toss them in. They will eat whatever meat is inside them, what remains, but they will also eat all of the chitinous exoskeleton of the shrimp, and that contains a lot of nutrients that are great for the isopods. So those are some of the protein sources I give them. I, of course, also give them fruits and vegetables. Uh, they eat uh, squashes, zucchini, uh, sweet potatoes are really good, carrots, things like that. They also like uh, fruits such as banana, apple, and orange, as well as, as other fruits. Um, I'm going to show you here, right after I gave them um, some bug burger, here are some 
uh, various isopods after having been given bug burger. As long as they're consuming all of the food, you really don't have to worry about mold growth. But if they're not consuming all of the food within about 24 hours, you do need to check on that food to make sure that it's not going to grow mold. Some foods, like sweet potatoes, are not really that likely to grow mold very quickly, while others, some of the fruits especially, are likely to mold very, very quickly. So anything that gets really moldy, you can remove. Keeping springtails with your isopods will help uh, reduce issues with mold, but if there's a large piece of food, it can mold over very quickly in a very humid, enclosed environment, and sometimes even springtails can't keep up with that. So good to make, keep on top of that. Just make sure you're checking every 24 hours or so. Substrate maintenance is another important aspect of caring for isopods. Uh, perhaps one of the most important because really you can have isopods thrive in an environment where they have enough humidity and a proper substrate without even giving any supplemental food at all. But if you don't have a good substrate, uh, they're not going to do well. So I would say as I look at my isopods, of course I have quite a few enclosures, as I check on them, I try to make sure, okay, do I need to add more leaves? Have they almost finished off the layer of leaves that's in here? Um, is the substrate, like the compost layer itself, starting to look like it's mostly composed of isopod waste or frass? Or do I have a little more time before that happens? If leaves are starting to get low, I throw in a few handful of leaves that I have sanitized in the oven at about 200 degrees for half an hour. These are uh, fallen, non-toxic, deciduous leaves from my backyard. I fortunately have quite a few trees in my backyard that my isopods can eat and I don't use any pesticides on my trees. So I just throw a few handfuls of those in and then every six months I try to replace the substrate completely or nearly completely. Uh, I've been trying to do that. I pick a time twice a year where I do that but lately I've decided that it might be actually easier if I just label each of the enclosures and when they've been changed and then I just change one or two as the opportunity arises and I can check the dates based on the label that I put on them. Because they really do need uh, a refresher of the substrate. The substrate needs to be completely removed every once in a while um, for best production, best health. And honestly, if I could do it every three months, I would and I'm, I'm kind of moving that direction to see if I can do a complete replacement of the substrate every three months. But uh, so far I've been doing it about every six months with pretty good results. There are a couple of other things to think about. One of them that you might not think about at all is that isopods, if they are presented with the opportunity to crawl out of the container somehow, that they can do that. And I have in the past lost a couple of uh, containers, or not the whole container, but I've had quite a few escapes from particular containers. And usually that results from some of the leaves having stems or sticks or things like that that stick all the way out of the enclosure. And then when you put down the lid, that uh, leaf reaches all the way up. It gives them kind of something to climb up along the side of the enclosure. And then because the leaf or stem or whatever it is is sticking out of the enclosure, they can crawl all the way out of the enclosure. And then of course they dry up and die in a house like mine where it's fairly dry. So you don't want to lose any isopods that way. So make sure that there's no avenue of escape by providing some sort of ramp uh, inadvertently as you uh, add leaves to the enclosure. Well, hopefully that gives you an idea of uh, the day-to-day -day maintenance of isopods. And I would like to show you something I discovered recently. I was looking in my Titans enclosure, my Porcelio Hoffman's A guy, and found this little guy. Now, there is a remote possibility that one of my Spanish orange isopods, just my Porcelio scabber, um, got into here, but I don't think that's what's going on. I think, and I certainly hope, that this is actually a, an orange Porcelio Hoffman's egg eye. That would be really exciting. So only time will tell. I've compared it carefully to my baby Porcelio Hoffman's egg eye and to Porcelio scabber of the same size, and they're actually pretty hard to tell apart. So a little time will tell whether this is actually an orange Porcelio Hoffman's egg eye. It would be really exciting if it were. Thanks for watching today. I post videos every Friday, all on aquarium and vivarium pets. Please feel free to share rate, comment, and if you haven't already, subscribe. And then click the bell icon so you don't miss my next video. <gasps> what? I got an orange one. Oh. I got an orange one. Oh, an orange in, what? In what, in which, like which bucket is that? What's I've, usually in I've there? I've got an orange Titan. Well, what's usually in there? Titans. Oh. Orange Titan, that's a mutation. Wait, like the Titans one are like this big? Yes. 
I got oh, an orange dang. one. I got an orange one. That's gonna be real cool. Yeah. That'll be super cool.